Uh, today I'm going to be talking a little bit about two-photon microscopy, uh, kind of go across a, a wide variety of things. I've been saying for the last couple of years, if you've seen some of my talks, and if you haven't, um, some of this will be a little bit of a repeat, um, but basically microscopy has gotten a bit more complicated than it used to be many years ago. Um, this really isn't a problem, though. I mean, the bottom line with anything that we're working with is to be able to identify the instrument that you're working with, know what it can do, and use it for its proper purpose. You're not going to be picking a 4x5 camera to be shooting party pictures, right? So likewise, you're not going to be picking the wrong microscope to be able to go off and do 3D time-lapse uh, mitochondrial dynamics. You know? So you have to really look at your instrument as a really fancy camera and ask the very simple question, how does the darn thing work? All right. So not only does how it work, but what are its advantages? What are its disadvantages versus other uh, potential things? Um, and what I do when I do my training is, is I call it this practical theory approach. The idea is you need to kind of understand some of the basics, uh, a little bit of the theory, but not so much that, you, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm with Jim, I'm, I'm not a numbers guy. Uh, there are other people that are much better about that, but I do know how it functions and, and its practical application. So we talk about that a lot. And then you have to get into the logistics. Just because a microscope can do something, well, if, if you've got the perfect setup on an inverted microscope, but you need an upright microscope, you've got to take a different approach. So again, you have to figure out exactly what it is you want to do and what instrument you've got on hand to be able to work with it. So that's kind of what we're going to go through today. So when we're talking about two photon, we have to kind of go back to some of the basics. And I'm going to run through a, a little bit of uh, kind of the continuum here. In microscopes, there's sort of a continuum of, uh, of complexity, starting with your basic bright field instrument that you, know, you saw back in biology class in, in high school. And working its way up, you're going from bright field to fluorescence to confocal to two photon. There's, there's parts of all of this that you need to understand, starting with the very beginning and working your way up. So with two photon especially, you have to understand fluorescence. And so if you're not used to doing fluorescence, a little primer on fluorescence. We'll kind of go through this. You all probably recognize the little spectrum here, and you realize that you're dealing with everything from the ultraviolet range over here up to the infrared range over there. And the numbers that we're dealing with are down in the 300s, uh, low 400s, up to the 700s, 800s, that type of a range when you're looking at numbers. What's important to understand with fluorescence is the issue that at the lower wavelengths, the ultraviolets, you have a higher frequency and a higher energy output versus at the, the higher wavelengths, you've got a lower frequency and a lower energy. This becomes important when we're dealing with trying to excite fluorophores. So the way fluorescence actually works, if you consider this as a fluorophore, you've got a nucleus and you've got uh, um, electrons in the outer shell. When you excite this particular fluorophore with a high energy photon of energy, um, what it's going to do is knock that electron into an outer valence shell. It's going to stay there a very, sh very short amount of time, and then it's going to back down into the original state. Yay! Um, and when it goes back down, it's going to release some energy. But it's not going to release as much as what went into it because it's also losing a little bit of heat, a couple of other things. So what you wind up with is you're exciting at a lower wavelength, and you're then emitting at a higher wavelength. So in the cases of like colors, if you want to look at colors, you're talking about exciting, in this case, blue, and emitting in green, all right? Uh, maybe you're exciting in green and it's going to emit in red. But either way, you're dealing with that, uh, that direction from the lower wavelengths to the higher wavelength. Okay, so where do these fluorophores come from? So um, a lot of... Uh, a lot kind of goes into trying to figure out exactly how you're going to label a sample. So uh, you can deal with uh, external stains where you're taking your sample and you're labeling it with DAPI or Alexa 488 or FITSI or whatever you, you've got. All these particular dyes are going to fluoresce at very specific colors. Um, you also have endogenous fluorophores. In other words, uh, autofluorescence from a sample. The sample is just going to naturally fluoresce and I know Chip Hedgecock's got some wonderful pictures of uh, these desert animals that uh, will autofluoresce. So that's an example of that sort of thing. 
Um, and then you can make your own, basically. That's what transgenics is for. With transgenic approaches, you can essentially incorporate a uh, colored, a uh, fluorescent protein directly into the genome of an animal. And you can be very, very specific about it. If you only want it in the mitochondria of the cancer cells that you put into the, into the animal, you can do that too. So this way you can label different parts of the cells or individual cells with specific fluorophores, which we're then going to be able to track as we kind of go along. Now, when we're talking about fluorescence again, we have to look at exactly what these specific excitation <laughs> and emission curves are going to be. So when you look at this, this curve set, these are very specific to every fluorophore out there. Every one is going to have its own excitation and its own emission range. And the key to this is if you're looking at this dotted line here, this is the um, set for Alexa 488. If you're looking at this dotted line, what it's telling you is that if you excite this fluorophore with any wavelength of light along that dotted line, you're going to get it to fluoresce. And when it fluoresces, it's going to emit a greener light anywhere along that solid line. So basically shifting left to right, that's the Stokes shift up there. Um, but for the most part, this is very well characterized in standard, what I'll call 1P, or you know, one photon fluorescence. It's very well established. You know that you have a peak in this particular one around 488 nanometers. It's going to emit around 520 or so. Um, but it's not just at one place. It's along this entire curve. And we're going to make use of that later on. So anyway, as long as we can excite it someplace, some places are going to be very low efficiency, and some of them are going to be very high efficiency. But either way, it's going to make it fluoresce. If you're trying to photograph it, this is your basic idea of what you're doing when you're photographing fluorescence. You have your excitation source over here, and it's exciting down at my sample. My sample is now going to emit. So if we're exciting the blue light, it's then emitting the green light, and you've got green light coming out, and you want to be able to photograph that green light. Well, unfortunately, you also have some reflected blue light coming out, so you need to put some kind of a barrier filter in the way in order to block out any of that reflected light, and then that way you're only looking at the green light. So in the microscope, the way you do that is with these very specific filter cube sets. So you have a different filter cube depending on the particular fluorescent dyes that you're working with. Most of them work with some kind of a broad spectrum light, like it used to be mercury lamps, but now more metal halides and, and LEDs are becoming a lot more common. But you have a white light source, which is going to go through your excitation filter, which is basically your color. So you've got a, in this case, we have, say, a blue excitation filter. That light is then going to come into this little box. Inside the box at a diagonal, you have a dichroic mirror which is a very specific thing which is going to reflect certain wavelengths and transmit others. In this particular case, it's going to reflect anything underneath about 500 nanometers. So that 488 nanometer light that we're bringing in over from the left is going to reflect down to my sample. My sample then is going to say, okay, I'm going to emit, and it's going to go up, and the same dichroic mirror is going to pass anything above 500 nanometers. So the green light gets through and goes up and then the camera is going to be up towards the top. So that's basically the way um, you're getting your, your fluorescence light source, your sample, and then the image that you're going to uh, get out of that. When you're looking at a microscope, my, most microscopes out here can basically do either bright field or fluorescence. Well, if, they, if they're a fluorescent scope, they can also do bright field. They don't all have the fluorescence built onto them. But you basically have different light paths on the microscope. For regular bright field transmitted light, the light is coming from underneath, it's going through, it's going straight up through, transmitting up to where the cameras are up here. With fluorescence, you have the light source in the back, it's coming in, this is where the filter cubes are, and that's going to knock the light going down to my sample, which is then going to go back up to where the camera is. So that's the light path that we're dealing with when we're dealing with the fluorescent stuff. It's the same instrument, but we're using it in different ways. So with fluorescence, what kind of pictures do you get? So what we have here is a two-channel image of a very thick sample through a brain section. Uh, and what you're seeing is basically a green uh, fluorescence and a red fluorescence. Uh, and where you, they overlap, you're seeing sort of a yellow fluorescence. But it doesn't look very good. It's kind of blurry. Um, you got the colors in there, but we got a problem with general wide field fluorescence in that it's not really quite sharp enough because we've got this really thick sample that we're going through. 
And that's where we jump up to the next level of techniques. We take the fluorescence and we put it on steroids and we do confocal imaging where we can then take individual slices as we're going through the sample and recreate them into a much sharper image. So this is the same thing left and right. On the left side with a wide field scope, on the right side with confocal. So when you're talking about confocal then, you need to get a little understanding of how it makes every one of these nice thin slice sharp images. So what we're going to do is we're going to figure out essentially in the system you're able to focus through the sample non-destructively and take a thin slice and then add them all together to get that shot that uh, I showed you in the last slide. I have two instruments uh, at uh, my position. We have the Leica SP-8 on the left, the SP-5 on the right. Little complicated bits to deal with, but at their core, their core they work just like that original kind of um, simplified diagram that I was showing you before with regular fluorescence. Um, by the way, this scope right here, so at the core of any confocal microscope is a regular microscope. All right, it's, it's nothing fancy. This is an inverted microscope here. And this one we have next door. All right, it doesn't have the confocal part on it, but it's the base part of it. All right, so how does a confocal work? Um, we have a thick sample. We have a lot of light going on. And we need to take a look at how the confocal takes the out of focus light out of the light path, leaving us with just a, a thin slice, because that's what it does. At the bottom, you see this is a cell. All right, so we have the outline of a cell with a nucleus in the middle. And what confocal does is it's going to illuminate the entire volume of the cell. Everything is going to be glowing now, everything uh, high, everything low. And we're going to look at three different spots within the cell, either on the upper membrane, in the middle of the nucleus, or maybe in the cytoplasm underneath. But each one of these is right above the other. Okay? Now, if we focus at one place, that would be our focal plane, plane of focus, we're going right through that red dot. Okay? So that's where we're focused, that's where the, the um, uh, microscope is, is focused at that point. And if you're looking at your general diagram, we're going to put a pinhole. Uh, at a relative place, which is at the confocal point, in other words, it's a nodal point in the, in the system uh, that comes into focus at the same place as the plane of focus. Okay? So if you're following that, and we can take a quick look at a, at a ray diagram, follow the light from the red dot, and it's going to go up, and, and it's placed just so that one thin spot is going to get through the pinhole and go all, all the way up to the top to help form our image. Now what happens to the light that's above that plane of focus? In the wide field system, it would be some of that blurry light, all right, creating some of that background in our image. But in this case, what happens, if you follow the blue line, it's going to cross together at a point below the pinhole, and then it's going to hit the pinhole and get removed from the light path. So ta-da, it doesn't make it up to the camera. Same with the one below. If we look at the green line, it would have actually come together about here maybe, but again, it hits the pinhole before um, and, and gets removed from the light path. So this is how confocal works. And there's a couple of main points to think about here. And one of the big ones is that you are illuminating the entire volume and you're taking the out of focus light away. But you're affecting the entire cell. All right? Keep that thought in mind as we move on. So if you take confocal and you put it on steroids, you get to the topic of the day, which is two photons. So this is my two-photon system. Uh, I did a little panorama shot to give you an idea of the size. That's an eight-foot air table back there. It weighs a ton. Um, and the laser back here, this is the two-photon laser back there, and you've got things all over the place. A little more complicated than your little point-and-shoot camera. But again, at the base, all it is is the camera that we want to figure out how we're going to get the image that you see on the screen. 